Chris Harvey, I'm from Selsey. I've been fishing all my life, so about 15, 16 years. Uh, we mainly fish for crab and lobster. Fishing's in the blood. Uh, my dad was a fisherman, my brother is. The thing I like about my job is the freedom. I love being at sea, I love to fish. It's just a great lifestyle for me, I love it. And it's not a job at all, it's a way of life. My name is David Stevens. I'm based uh, in Newlyn. Uh, we land our fish regularly in Plymouth. We work a twin rig whitefish trawler. We've had uh, our boat for five years. The boat is uh, 23 years old. I've been fishing for 23 years and it's a family run business. Uh, the things I enjoy most about my, my job is the unexpected. My name is Neil Prentice and I'm from Tarbert. Involved in uh, fishing for 35, 36 years. Even when I was in school, I, I would go to before school and after school, a few pots and hand line for mackerel. We retail, export and wholesale for shellfish from here. My name is Ian Harkis. I've been in the industry since I left school and I'm skipper on board this boat. The thing I most enjoy about the job is having good hauls of fish. As an island nation, the seas that surround us are some of our greatest assets. For hundreds of years, these waters have provided our people with an abundance of food and our fishermen with livelihoods that span generations. If this is to continue, then the needs of sustainability and environmental responsibility have to be balanced with the interests of the fishing industry. With greater understanding, we can work together to achieve that critical balance and ensure that this vital resource is both responsibly harvested and properly cared for. For our fishermen, going to sea is a way of life that is both rewarding and challenging. For a boat like mine, it's quite expensive. It's you're talking probably up to 80 to 100,000. But once you've bought the boat, the main, one of the main expenses is the gear, and the, out, the outlay for that is, is quite a lot of, lot of money. 40, 50 grand, I'm sure thought. Uh, it's, not, it's not cheap, and that, that's why there's no, not that many youngsters coming into the fishery these days. All of our, uh, all of our funding that we had was through family, and, uh, which made it a lot easier to get into. Banks wouldn't, they won't even touch you. You can't guarantee money, sort of thing. With the weather and cost of everything, you can't, they can't, you can't guarantee them it. There's free costs when you're buying a vessel. Uh, obviously, ours is an older vessel, so it's, it's an expensive step for us. A vessel costs half a million pounds to buy. That was just for the fishing vessel and just the license. In actual fact, the, the largest part of our business is, is quota. And uh, our quotas, we've had to spend around about £800,000 on buying quota. So, you know, the entire business that you see behind me is around about £1.3 million. Um, and then, obviously, if we were then looking to upgrade a boat to uh, a newer one, maybe one 10 years old, we'd probably be looking at spending £800,000 to £900,000 and buying a newer boat. A brand new boat, you'd be talking around about £1.6 million don't have that kind of money myself at the moment. I'd love to be able to build a new one, but um, it's something we don't, we're saving towards. It's something we'd very much like to do. Um, and it's something we'd like to do in the future. But, you know, you have to be talking to the bank quite closely. So, you know, you have a good relationship with your bank manager. It's a very risky business. So the bank manager has to understand the business. Um, so that relationship is extremely important. And one of the difficulties we have, considering the largest part of your business is the quota. You cannot borrow against that, and so it's, it's what we call an intangible asset. So you don't get any tax relief for buying it, and you don't, and you're not able to borrow against it within the business. So actually, raising the money uh, to to actually get a vessel which would be more efficient, a newer vessel would be more efficient, is extremely difficult because of that purpose, for that reason. I have a, a, a 110 meter prawn creel boat that it, it shares in two twin rig prawn trawlers. The cost of these boats are over £200,000, including the licenses and quota. For two of them, we have bank loans, which we, we have to serve. What most of us don't really appreciate is the scale of investment involved in running a fishing business. When you start out, you obviously have to get a loan to buy the boat in the first place. Uh, it should cost about £2 million to buy. The boat is um, 34 metres long, which is quite big for the Scottish fleet. but. The value of the boat's not the big part of it now, it's a quota. We own probably about four million pounds worth of quota. And we probably could do with owning about six or seven million pounds worth of quota to be comfortable. You don't want to borrow too much because 
there's no guarantee that the quota that you're buying, the, the government could change the rule and you could lose all that quota. It's a pretty tricky one to, there's a bit of gamble there, whether you buy or you don't buy quota. But for us, it's helped our business immensely, having quota and not having to lease so much. Owning your own stuff has been a big help to us to give us profit each year. On top of the initial cost of the boat and equipment, there are ongoing operating costs. Maintenance for our, for our gear and boat and everything is an ongoing thing. We, uh, every, every day, or every week, we're always doing something. Uh, further afield you're going, it's more fuel as well, which obviously cuts down on your profit. So you have to weigh up where you're going to fish and what sort of day you're going to have. It's the outlay of everything, really. For the, for the prawn trawling side, we have enough quota for most of the year, but if we, we run out of quota, we've got to lease some, which is a very big expense, uh, along with the fuel, which is a, a real headache at the moment. It's probably half of our weekly expense, and obviously the, the, the stores for the, the boats and your landing dues and what have you. For a 10-day trip, for example, we use about £25,000 worth of fuel, so that's a lot of fish for fuel alone. We've got 13 men to pay, it's 13 families, and that's just part of it. You have food, you have insurance, there's a lot of overheads in a boat like this. The, the big changes in the last few years, I would say, is price of fuel increasing, which has is, is increased dramatically. It's quite worrying when you're, where we spend about £750,000 a year in fuel. And when we bought the boat, our target was to gross 1.2 million to make it pay. Well, that wouldn't have worked now. The sea is not always the most hospitable place to earn a living, but these days the business environment is equally testing. We're predominantly a day boat, up to the maximum of sort of 10 hours, but average day is sort of seven, eight hours a day. And uh, every day we can get out, we'll be out. So if, it, uh, if the weather's good, and the winds are light, we're out, be out every day of the week, yeah. But we have to be versatile to survive, really. Um, if something's not, uh, say, fishing very well, crab and lobster's quiet, or we, we, we jump on the whelks, do some of that, or, um, or the white fish, if that's better. We obviously we're free to fish where, where we like, but yeah, we do sort of stick to certain areas. Obviously, we're regulated by weather. The level of catch for us, it can fluctuate a lot. I mean, you can go out and you can get a, a, a fairly decent day's work, or sometimes, you can just about break even. It's, it's, it can be anything really. The winter time is going to be very lean, whereas summer and, and autumn can be very, very profitable. We target up to around about 25 to 30 different species, trying to balance that with the economics of trying to make a trip or the year work for us for air fishing. We need longer term management plans and it needs to be more regionalised, and that would have a, a huge effect on how we go about managing the business. And also, when you look at it from a business point of view, long-term management plans also offer businesses like us um, longer-term strategies. So when we want to go to borrow and invest in the industry, we have a longer plan to, to work from, and that would be extremely useful for our business. I would say uh, the, the way the economic climate is at the moment, especially in Spain, they, they seem to have cut the amount they want to take, and as well as they're quibbling more about the price than they, they used to do. As we see in the news just now, the, the way the Spanish uh, economic climate is, it's understandable. I would say probably 90% of the prawns and shellfish really go to Spain uh, over the years. Since I come ashore and set this facility up, I've managed to turn it around to maybe 50 Spain and 50% uh, uh, in this country. Wages are getting squeezed all the time and the hours are getting longer, so it's, it, it's very difficult it's, and it's getting harder all the time. We've, we've done all our technical measures for our nets. At, at our own cost, uh, it changed from month to month. Running the business takes up a lot of your time. It's obviously long hours when you're at sea. Um, and you're probably in the wheelhouse 18 hours a day, I would say. But when you're home as well, there's quite a lot of work to do sourcing quota, watching the markets and sort of getting the news of the other boats where all the fish are or what type of fish is where and you could really spend all your time on your job. The easy thing about the job is catching the fish because the stocks are so healthy. 
we're in a scheme that we can't dump cod, so we've got to be really careful where we fish or we can exhaust our cod quota too early and if we exhaust our North Sea cod quota we can't fish any longer in the North Sea. So that's probably one of our biggest challenges just now is to avoid fish. When we talk about the business of fishing, one word comes up time and time again, quota. Year on year, as everyone knows, you get the quota talks from the EU. So that has a, that has a big effect on how we then go about fishing them within the year. So if you have a large increase within a certain stock, that allows you opportunities to be able to go and pursue that fish um, more. Obviously with the, well, the opportunities are less for a certain stock, uh, then we have to try and avoid that and to make up the difference trying to target what we call non-pressure stock species. Um, so it's a balancing act all the time and it's, it's one that we do spend a lot of our efforts at sea uh, trying to balance and it can be very difficult at times. Quotas are a complicated subject and one that causes much debate. Every year the fisheries ministers of EU countries set total allowable catches for key fish stocks each country has a quota from that total allowable catch, which is the amount that their fishing boats can land. The government distributes part of the UK quota amongst holders of fixed quota allocation units. In the UK, when people talk about owning quota, they mean that they hold fixed quota allocation units. Trading quotas is important within the industry in the respect of we have quota that we may not be using uh, that year because we have lower catches so we use that quota then to swap for quota that we have a higher catch rate of that year so you know the, the flexibility within the system is extremely important. The balancing act can become harder still. Quota is often leased from other quota holders. These leases can cost hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. We get a yearly quota and we keep that quota for the proper time of year to fish the certain area. It is very complex to, to utilise your quota properly because Sometimes the price that you're paying to lease your quota, you maybe don't even get for your fish when you land it. That can happen, but obviously it can't happen too often or your business is in trouble. So it is very complex. You've got to know the values of what you're catching and the values of your quota and try and make it work for your business. The business of fishing isn't just about those who go to sea. Fishing and related industry sectors employ large numbers, both on the boats and ashore. And unlike many jobs, fishing is more than work. It is a way of life that has supported our coastal communities for centuries. And we use uh, Plymouth Patrol agents as our auctioneers because it's an internet-based auction. You know, selling fish is quite high-tech now. We're on the internet and buyers will come from all over the country. I think there's presently around about 60 or 70 buyers who will actually go online around about 6 in the morning and they bid and then that fish is then sent to them um, through, from the auctioneers. Well, being in the family business, my mum does the books uh, with my dad uh, every Saturday. The paste that will come from the, from the week before and then they will work out the sharings for the crew and what expenses go out that week. And then they will inform us what, where we're at and where we're going. So my dad, he's like a shore manager if you like or ship's husband and he makes sure all the gear and all the uh, everything's ready for us when we come in. We take the, the, the live shellfish in and hold them just to keep them alive and fresh. Uh, just ready for dispatch to whoever orders it. You know, it could be hotels, restaurants, it could be members of the public, or it, uh, we could stuff this up to Glasgow every, every night of the year. And uh, we also, on a Monday, we, we still put the uh, langoustines and other shellfish onto the Spanish truck that comes in every Monday, uh, and that's 52 weeks of the year as well. When we're fishing the North Sea, we land most of the fish here in Peterhead. Um, it's the biggest fish market and generates probably the best prices. We know all the buyers that has our fish and we know where most of it ends up. We try and find out, out maybe through the trip or before we sail even um, what kind of fish they're looking for or maybe what kind of fish might be scarce the following week and maybe go and catch that. While everyone accepts these are demanding times for businesses, there is great optimism about the future. Sustainability is very important. If we don't look after the size of stuff, then there'll be nothing for the future. And we, all of our pots have got escape hatches in for the lobsters and small crabs, so they can all get, all the small ones can get, and juveniles can get out without fighting each other and damaging each other, which is uh, which is good for the future. I am worried about uh, the future of fishing, but at the same time, I do see a good 
uh, I do see a good future for it. As long as it's well maintained and looked after, I see a very good future for the, for the youngsters, whoever, if there are any coming up, and for myself. But uh, it has to be well maintained and looked after. I'm very optimistic about the industry. You know, the fishing is becoming easier each year, which is a very good sign. It means the stocks are healthier, finding crews a lot easier, and we've got a better way of life for that because we're able to have a little bit more time at home than we used to have when things are harder. So we have a better industry, the fishing is easier, we're more economical, we've started to see that in the last five years. The thing I see for the future is that uh, although the economic climate will probably take quite a long time to sort of itself out, but uh, I, I just uh, everybody's got to eat, so I feel that like we're in a, a good business for supplying uh, fresh seafood which is uh, very good for you anyway and if we can just turn around the British people to eat more of it I think that would uh, be a lot and it is changing but with uh, all the celebrity chefs that are putting the telly programmes on. We want sustainable fish stocks, we want a good environment for that fish and we want to be promoting a sustainable industry. A healthy sea equates to a productive sea. If we all understand each other's concerns, we can work together in partnership to ensure a sustainable and profitable future for our fishing industry.